maybe I should. Yeah, okay. So let's see if it actually records something useful. Um, okay. Um, no other questions? Yeah. You will post the slide. Yes, I'm, I'm going to hopefully do it. Yeah. Um, what do with this? Where can I use Okay. So, um, what we are going to start with is, is this um, framework, um, so called statistical decision theory. And um, it's an abstract framework, but I think it, it, it's really helpful uh, to think about the statistics in this general encompassing framework. As you will see, um, um, it helps you like um, think about the statistics like in a unified fashion. Basically, everything we're going to do is sort of within this framework, at least theoretically. So uh, there are a couple of ingredients. So there is a probability model, uh, which we um, denote as the script P. Um, it, it, what it is, it's a collection of probability measures. Uh, so this guy is sort of a formal probability measure. So, um, I'm gonna ask you guys in a second what a probability measure is, but uh, there's not one, but a family of them indexed by this parameter theta, and there's this parameter space um, in which this theta lies. So there's this parameter space omega, and then there's this um, uh, underlying sample space. So this, these probability measures are measured on the sample space. And um, what you can think of is basically that these, um, these are the distributions or the laws of some generic random variable that you observe. So you observe X, which could be like a scalar, it could be a vector, it could be something else. Uh, it's distributed like P theta for one of these theta. Okay, so let me ask you, what is a probability measure? Or like anyone has an idea of like what, what these guys are? Yes? Functions from the outcomes to the numbers. Um, we are, yeah, so it's, if you want to be really precise, there are, there are functions from events to, to, to what you said? Uh, the R1. The, the zero one, yeah. So they map like events, like subsets of outcomes to zero one. So they're, they're like formally a measure is like a set function um, that, that assigns a probability to an event. An event is just a collection of outcomes. Okay, what is the chance, for example, that if I flip a coin, uh, this is very simple. So, like, if I flip a uh, something which has like three possibilities, what is like the chance that I observe? Like, if there are possibilities one, two, three, what is the chance I observe two and three? Or what is the chance I observe like one and three? Or what is the chance I observe one? Um, another name is like distributions, right? So, um, if if you think of this as a random variable, this would be the distribution of that random variable. So this is like a random variable, a random vector, a random object distributed by P data. We're gonna make it a little bit more concrete, but uh, that is what it means, okay? Is this sort of clear? You're gonna see a lot of examples, okay? Um, good. Um, and then um, the difference between like statistic and probability, like at this first point, basically, um, that like probability, usually there is a probability measure. There is like probability under which everything happens. In the statistics, we don't know, like we have a bunch of candidates, okay? So you have a family and one of these data is generating the data, we don't know which one, that's the main idea. So statisticians sort of um, like are more open-minded. So we allow like a, like a bunch of possibilities for the distribution. And you wanna like pinpoint what is the actual distribution, which one of, so one of these is generating, we don't know which one. And you want to find the member of this class, which is equivalent. It's actually not equivalent, but sort of equivalent to finding the theta. Okay, we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, maybe you're seeing one of the homeworks that, uh, like, what we care about is figuring out this p theta. Uh, but if the model is well specified, it's equivalent to figuring out the theta. If there's a one to one mapping between theta and p theta. Um, okay, that's the first ingredient. Um, so the second ingredient is an action space. Uh, so a set of available actions or decisions. Um, so that's where the, the name of decision theory comes in. Uh, so given the, um, um, I'm gonna go back later 
tell you what, what that actually is. And then there's loss function, zero, one loss, for example, or quadratic loss. So if I give you one of these parameters and I give you an action, uh, then there's a loss. So if I, if the, let's say the true parameter, let's say the parameter that is generated the data is X, and you take the action, so we were going to take an action, let's say. So um, um, I'm going to go over this again. So the, if, if, you, if the true parameter is theta, you take the action A, you're going to say this uh, loss, let's say. Um, so for example, so if, if, if let's say uh, the action is, but the parameter is binary, there are two choices. Uh, and your action space is also binary, there are two choices. Um, if this is zero, one loss is saying that if the parameter is, let's say, zero, and your action is zero, you don't pay anything. So this is an indicator function. So this is saying, um, this is basically equivalent to writing um, um, one if theta is not equal to a and zero if theta is equal to a. So whenever theta is equal to a, I don't pay any price. If, if my action is not matching the parameter, I'm going to pay a price. Okay, so what does it mean? Um, basically, let's say you can think of um, the statistical inference. What the statisticians would like to do as a game between whoever is generating the data, let's say sometimes we call it the nature, let's say, or whoever is generating the data X, um, we're gonna play this game with them. So the nature picks the true parameter theta and draws uh, X according to P theta. Okay, so once it picks the true parameter, it specifies the distribution there, and then it generates, uh, they generate this X. And then given this X, uh, so X is a random element of X, the statisticians get to observe this x. Okay, so you get to observe x, and then you make a decision based on x, which is going to be a function of x. Okay, so there's this um, thing that's the job of statisticians to specify this decision rule. So what action should I take in response to any observation? Okay, so there's a mapping that maps values of x to the action say This is something called the decision rule. Um, and, and that's, that's our job. So we specify this delta and then we incur a loss. So we incur this loss, L theta delta x. Okay, so if your action is close to, usually the loss measures how close theta is to this action. Usually for us, usually the action space is the same parameter space. And usually um, our action basically is an estimate of theta. Okay, so if this action has the same like quality as theta, it's gonna be an estimate of theta. And depending on how close of this quadratic loss we're going to measure how close this is to theta. Um, so you can think of it as an estimate. Uh, so if, if this is our estimate of theta, if we're close to theta, then you pay a small loss. If we're far away from that, you pay a huge loss, like a bigger loss. The framework but in general, so the action space could be very different than theta. Um, and this can model other situations. But let's say for in, in this class, Basically, this action in space for us is usually the same as theta, and the action has the same meaning as theta. So it's an estimate of theta. Is. So you can think of this as sometimes um, like theta hat of x if you want. So it's a measure of or an estimate of theta. Okay, sounds good so far. Questions? I'm going to go over an example. Um, and then you can, in some Cases, um, if the game is adversarial, you can say that the negative of this is what nature gains. If you believe the other people, the person that generates this is, is doing it adversarial, but that's not necessarily the case. Hopefully, like fortunately, in most of the statistics, the data is not going to be that adversarial. But in any case, so these are the ingredients. So this loss is going to be a random value. Okay, it's a random quantity. Why is it a random quantity? Because x, so x is random. This is going to be a function of this. This is another random value. Usually, the loss is um, um, real value, so it's a scalar. Even if x, for example, is a vector or some other exotic object, this thing is a number, but it's a random number. So, it's, um, so how do we measure performance if this is random? Um, very typical thing is is that people take uh, the expectation. Okay, so you take the expected loss. Um, so if, so ignore this theta for now. So if I take the expectation of this random variable, I get a number, deterministic number, and that would be my measure of loss, uh, as we call it um, risk. 
So expected loss is called the risk. And this quantity is uh, basically the main object of decision tree. So uh, in decision tree, you want to find a decision rule that minimizes this risk. Okay, expected your expected loss. Um, sounds good. Um, so now let me ask you a question. Has, has anyone seen this notation? So what I mean by P sub theta in one of your, like your division? Have, have you come across this notation? I see a bunch of, uh, yeah. Yes. So why do I put a theta there? Um, the, the, so theta is a good a good point. So theta doesn't have a distribution. So in, in the setting that I'm, I'm talking about, there is no distribution. Theta is a deterministic quantity. The only randomness here is in X. Okay. Um, and so certainly the distribution of delta X is different than theta. That's true, but theta basically is constant. Okay. Uh, but you're close. So there's another thing. Um, Okay, great. Yeah. So what I mentioned above is that um, the distribution of X is not like something that we know. We know the family from which it comes from, but it's parameterized by theta. We don't know which one. So there is a dependence in the distribution of X um, in theta. So basically what this is saying is that take the expectation, assuming that X is distributed like P theta for the theta that is the true theta, the one that's generating the data, which, which we don't know. Um, so this is to emphasize that the distribution of X is dependent on theta. And so the distribution of everything else is gonna depend on theta. So this is a function of X. So it's distribution is inherited. Like there's a derived distribution for delta X. It would also depend on theta. This whole thing is gonna be doubly dependent on theta because there's an explicit theta here. And also because this part distribution depends on theta. So this guy will have a distribution which is dependent on theta through two different sources. And so this is just a notation for taking the expectation under this distribution. We're assuming that X is distributed like this. Okay, it's a little bit um, pedantic. And at some point you're gonna forget about it, um, but it's good, good early on to, to make this distinction. Uh, uh, it shows uh, like the difficulty of the problem. Okay, so there is a dependence in this risk on theta to two sources. One, because this explicit, uh, because of this explicit data here, and because the distribution of the underlying observation depends on theta. Um, is that sort of clear? Okay. So this is very abstract. Some people might not like it. I'm going to do a little bit more abstract, like one more slide, and then we're going to see examples. Hopefully, it becomes more clear. Uh, but this is like basically the whole game. Okay, so if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. No, that's the whole point. I we don't know the value of theta. Yes, there is a fixed theta that's generating this, but we don't know which one, right? And so, so you want to let's say think of this delta x as our guess for theta as our estimate of theta. So based on the family and based on the observation, they're gonna output the guess for theta. And you're gonna pull this loss. So you, can, you can think of this as just theta hat if you want. Um, it's like, we're gonna do something like that. And theta hat implicitly depends on something they might write it as. So let's write it like this, delta x. If you wanna be really pedantic, there is a rule. This is a sort of deterministic rule at this point. Um, and then when I evaluated x, it would give me an estimate. So that would be a random variable. So this rule could be deterministic. So what should I do? When I, and I, at some point in the course, this rule is also going to be randomized. Yeah. No, no, just what I was going to ask. We're minimizing probability decisions, right? Yeah. So technically, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, ideally, you want to minimize all decisions. Yeah. Yeah. 
we're going to see that this is not easy because because of the kinds of data. Um, there's some issues, but yeah. So you want to find within the class of decision rule, find the one that minimizes the risk that we get given the sample that we have. Uh, no, actually, um, that's a distinction between decision rule and uh, so once you specify the decision rule is specified by that family that you have over there. But once you specify the decision because you can see the and take the expectation, I'm looking the average over all possible exits that come from. It doesn't matter which particular X you're looking at. Right? Uh, in any practical situation, you apply this decision rule to your X to get an estimate of three hat. But the rule is not dependent on your observation. Yeah. Does that make sense? We'll see examples of this. Um, just imagine that when I take expectation, X goes away. Okay, there's no X. Yeah, that's a good point. That's the like, distinction that I was trying to make. Um, a decision rule. At this point, is a deterministic object. We can find it without saying any observation. What we only need is our, our those ingredients: so the, the probability model, the loss, and the like. The action state basically just take it to the parameter state. So basically, one, once I specify the probability model and the loss, then I can define this, and I can ask for the optimal rule. What is the the decision rule that minimizes this? And um, Let's say if there's a deterministic rule, we would like to find. Maybe point out that later we'll see that we could have randomized this. So there could be some random. Even this map could be random. Okay, the randomness come, can come from somewhere else. So you can flip a coin and decide based on your observation and the result of that point flip what you're going to do. That would be a randomized rule. Uh, but then randomness usually has nothing to do with your observation. So it comes from somewhere else. Okay, good questions. Any other? It's interesting that at this level abstraction, we still have interesting questions. Okay, so other questions? Just, I just want to point out in the next slide, um, you can write this formally as an integral, but as we'll see, we usually you don't write things as integral. So you can just compute that expectation by using properties or expectations. Um, but if you want to formally write it, um, that's one way of writing. So imagine that this um, is a random variable. It's a function. Think of it as a uh, function of x. In, like ignore the theta for now. Like the whole thing wants to fix theta is a function of x. And so you're computing the expectation of uh, g of x. And so this, if you have seen it, it's just um, this is a famous formula early on. You probably if you learn, you can either take find the distribution of this and then compute the expectation by taking like integral of x against that distribution or you can just do integral of gx against the distribution of x this is this probably is um, too familiar for people that they don't realize that this is it here we probably would be. okay but that's how you compute it this is let's say um, the density of the random variable let's say random variable continuous that's how you compute the density right um, in this course, I'm sometimes going to write this as in the measure theoretic fashion, like dp, um, this should be p theta. So if I want to be like a little bit um, forward looking, I'm going to write it like that. This would be the density of the random variable x if it has a density. But if I don't want to assume that there is a density, um, I'm going to write something like this which might make people a little bit uncomfortable, but this is just, if, if it makes you uncomfortable, it's meant to replace it with that. So that's that's what I'm writing here. So this is my G of X basically, um, and DP theta of X. So this is a major theoretic type of notation, um, which is just a fancy way of saying that if um, this is a usual key, capital P theta has a density, let's say, uh, if the data has density uh, with respect to, again, this is a measure theory sort of type of uh, thing, with respect to some underlying measure mu, then I can write it as um, P theta X times D mu of X. Um, and this mu usually in like traditionally like in lower division probability courses, this mu is the Lebesgue measure. Uh, Lebesgue measure. 
if the random variable is continuous, for example, Gaussian distribution, so you write just as the x the measure so that it's implicit. How many people know what the, what the egg measure is? Okay, good. We don't we don't need to know it. Just the usual integral, right? The length, basically, what measures the length. Um, you can think of the measure as sort of assigning a measure on a real line assigned to values to subsets of the real line. So the measure that assigns length. So, so if I have uh, interval zero to one, um, the measure on the real line would assign a number to this. The measure that assigns like the length of it is the Lebesgue measure. So the Lebesgue measure of this is going to be one. The Lebesgue measure of this is going to be two. The Lebesgue measure of something like this is going to be two, right? So the unit of things and so on. So that's the usual thing. And then, um, for example, the Gaussian distribution has density. It's like the, if X is like normal, let's say normal with mean theta and the variance one, this, this is our, let's say P theta. This guy, for example, has density, has a density respect to the Lebesgue measure, right? So everyone knows, right? So what, what is the density of this? Um, hopefully you know at some point. Uh, so this is gonna be the density. So what it means is that um, I can take the integral of this density over an interval and get the probability. So what this means is P theta of A is gonna be integral over A, P theta of X dx. That's basically what the idea of a density is. So um, the probability assigned to a set A uh, let's say probability that I'm in zero one, this is going to be integral from zero to one p theta of x dx. I can do it with any measurable set. So this would be zero to one, for example, e to the negative x minus theta squared over two dx. There's a very short introduction to uh, densities and not an introduction to measure theory. Assume that you know what the measure sort of a measure is. This is. So if, if these make you uncomfortable, just ignore it, just replace it with like P theta of X dx, okay? Um, the, the, the main point of the measure here is that we can do a, a unified treatment of like discrete cases, continuous cases, there's some variables that cannot fit within the either category. So for example, if you have a discrete random variable, um, usually this is not gonna be the way you write it, you'd write it as like L of theta delta x p theta of x, p theta of x would be the probability that you observe that particular x over all the x's. So this would be write it as sum. Um, so for example, if this random variable takes values one, two, three, four, and uh, then this, this, this sum would be like over x uh, from one to four. And this is gonna be the probability that you observe the value x one, two, three, four. Um, and this turns out to be a dense, so this is, uh, uh, in order to avoid writing uh, either this or like integral L theta delta X, P theta of X dx. So this P theta of X here has a different meaning. This is a density, this is a probability mass function. Uh, but if, if, if you can make, just write something like this, this sort of takes care of both cases. So this is also, this turns out to be this, if the random variable is discrete and has a, then it would have a, would have a density respect to the counting measure. And this, this probability mass function would be the um, density of the counting measure. But none of this is important. So just, just a like, brief aside, that's the kind of thing that, if you read Keener, you might see this notation or this notation, or so from time to time, we're gonna say that P data has a density respect to some underlying measure. Um, I can come back to this if you are interested, depending on how many people in the class are interested in the gory details of measure theory. Um, we'll come back to it, okay? Or any questions? There's a little bit of like um, assumption that I say P data has a density of like mu, this mu is constant, there's no dependence on theta. The family that has this problem is called a dominant family, but um, We'll see that. I mean, um, and I, and I make this assumption I'm implicitly assuming something. Um, a more general setting is that these are very general, um, and you might not find one measure that dominates everything. So, but but 
this is like a little bit uh, getting ahead of ourselves. Okay, so a brief like uh, detour into integration. So is this like clear to people? That's how you compute it. So if I give you the p theta, potentially I give you the density of the p in the small p theta. So the distinction between the small p theta and the capital p theta is that this is a density that's a measure. So this this assigns numbers to sets. This is something that we integrate over sets to get those numbers. Okay. So this is a function um, over the x. This is a function over subsets of x. Uh, that's the distinction. So if I give you p theta or I give you this these densities, then you can compute the risk. Okay. It's, it's possible, it's just a um, calculus prop. Um, if I specify also delta x, so I could specify delta x the decision rule, I specify the p theta x and we can calculate the risk. But that's often not how you can calculate the risk. There are much easier ways to calculate it based on the properties, uh, and we'll see that. Any question? Uh, okay. This is the slide that I would like every time to avoid, but I end up talking about it. So if you, if you didn't like that, it's fine. Nothing is going to be lost if you don't understand that slide that much. So here's an example. So a coin means that um, anyone estimate the probability of it coming up heads. This may be the, the simplest statistics question. So if someone flips a coin a bunch of times, and you want to like estimate what is the probability that it coming up, probability of it coming up heads. Okay. Um, so before we try to evaluate estimators for, for the probability, let's try to see how we can fit it into the this is integrated framework. One possible model um, is to assume that um, I observe this vector of binary um, variables, x1 up to xn. So every time I flip a coin, I can model it as a zero or one. So instead of heads and tails, I, I model it as zero or one. So zero, let's say, is tails. Doesn't matter which, like, okay, let's say if I want to estimate um, heads, let's say uh, heads is one, tail is zero. So if I uh, flip it like five times, um, the first time it could come up tails and then tails, heads, um, tails, and heads. Okay, so here n is uh, five. And so my data would be the, a binary vector uh, of length uh, five, right? So this would be the outcome in the first observation, second observation, third observation, fourth observation. Okay. I repeat the problem another time that I observe another sample, it would be something else. It's random, right? But I get to observe the realization of this random binary vector. Okay, that's how we can model the observations. How do I specify p theta? Uh, the way I'm going to specify it is that um, by saying uh, that each one of these xi's uh, is a Bernoulli random variable, probably theta, and their iid. Okay. If I specify something like this, uh, I'm implicitly specifying the, 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 the entire distribution of that. Yeah. So what is a Bernoulli variable? Let's see. What is a Bernoulli theta variable? No, I don't know. It's a kind of distribution. Yes. Yeah. Like that. Uh, I guess you're saying here theta, the probability of theta that comes to one. Yes, exactly. So it's a distribution for a binary variable that takes value zero or one. And when I say very many theta, this theta is the probability of observing one. And because there are two outcomes, one minus theta would be the probability of observing zero. Okay. So that, that's how I write it. For example, if I want to write it like this, um, let me put a theta here. The probability that xi, each one of these xi's is um, the Bernoulli, so the probability that xi is equal to x is theta if x is equal to one and zero otherwise. And you can compactly write it as this. Um, if you uh, note that x takes only zero or one values, you can plug it in here. If x is zero, this is all range of one minus theta. And if x is one, this, this, this factor goes away to theta. So this is a compact way of writing it. So this basically is 
the probability mass function for it's that that p theta of x sort of um, it's actually this trend has to be yeah this is a little bit different case, but this is if, if we only observe the single one that would be the pmf p theta of x but because we observe multiple ones uh, so this is a distribution of a single entry and i'm saying they're iid so what does iid mean Yes, independent identity distribution. So each one of these xi's has the same distribution, they're independent. By this assumption, I'm implicitly specifying the entire joint distribution, right? So this vector, the distribution is defined um, by saying that they're independent and then specifying the marginal distribution, which I'm saying all of them are the same and they're very independent. But this ID assumption is, um, let's say, very common. In like most early statistics, so you assume that you observe a bunch of random variables that have have been generated from an IAD process, and they're like the n of them. That, that would be your sample size. Um, but in the decision period framework, the entire thing is one observation. Okay, so this x is a single observation in our language, but inside is basically n binary observations. Okay. Um, so if you want to be formal, the sample space is this binary cube, zero, one to the n. So what does this notation mean? It's a Cartesian product, yeah. So if, if you, um, this is basically the sequence of all possible binary sequence of length, just the formality. Uh, and P theta, if you want, it's just, um, this is again a formality. It's like product measure. Uh, a product of a bunch of these. So this is basically Bernoulli theta. This fancy product, Bernoulli theta, fancy product. Um, so if you know what a product measure is, this is that. If you don't know, it's just the distribution of a random vector whose entries are IAD from Bernoulli theta. Okay, this is just saying that this is specified completely based on the marginal. Um, a product measure. Again, this is um, not needed if you don't know what it is. But if you're interested, in Google is what is a product measure. This is, this is the fancy way. And then the product is basically specified as zero one because um, theta is a probability. Uh, and so you can say that this uh, distribution has a joint PMF called weak mass function. And um, this, this joint PMF is going to factorize. Right, because of the independence. And so it's going to be, remember, if you have random wave x1 and x2, um, the probability mass function of this um, is going to be like px1 of x1 times px2 of x2 if they're independent. And, and this is the marginal distribution or PMF of x1. This is the marginal P, uh, PMF of x2. So that's the independence. That's where independence comes in. And um, so because of this, you can write it as a product of these marginal M PMS. Each one is like this, and it just has to put xi here. Right, so this, this is what we get for the joint PMS. This is another way of specifying this product measure. So I just specify the probability mass function. I can plug in any binary sequence here, and I get uh, a value, right? For example, if I, first, is this sort of clear? Question now. Yes. What's the difference between the little p theta joint PMF versus the families for the XI and that PMF? Um, you think between this and yeah. this? Side? Okay, so that's the distinction I made here, right? So this is this is the probability measure. So it's a set function assigned probability to sets. Um, this is the density, right? In this setting, it's a little bit. Um, so this, for example, tells you um, not only the probability of a particular sequence, but what is that if you a bunch of sequences as a, like a subset of, of this, what is the probability of that set? Uh, uh, which is gonna be just a sum of the individual. So this is like the probability of individual outcomes. Yeah, yeah. So this is, if you want, this is like, in this case, um, P theta of X1 up to Xn is capital P theta, of x1 up to xn. So 
this gives you the probability of these singleton events. Um, okay, but I can like concatenate multiple of these um, and it's still. So this is basically enough to specify this entire set function. So I can evaluate the probability of any subset of the sequences, right? It's a formal distinction, but it's an important distinction. That's it for every set. Small big data is an element of larger big data. No, no, no. Um, what I'm, I'm trying to say, let's say, uh, okay, so let's do this. Uh, so that example that we have there, X is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Sorry. Okay. Um, P theta of, let's say, X, which is, I'm being a little bit sloppy here, but that's fine. Uh, this is going to be, this is, um, if I write it like, it would be like, um, what would it be if I write this down? Uh, it's just the probability of this would be one minus theta, probability that the first one is zero times the probability that the second one is zero times the probability that the third one is one, and then one minus theta and then times theta. Um, and you can see that this is exactly this. If you go look at this, it's the x i to which, which, which one you pick, either one minus theta or two. So that's this guy. And you can evaluate it for any one of um, the possibilities. Um, this this would be also p um, p theta of x the single quantity. Okay, but I can also let's say compute the capital p of let's say zero zero one zero. Um, what is the chance that I observe this or zero 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 zero? So this is now an event. Okay, so this is well defined for this. This outputs a number for this. This is not, this is just defined for you. Right, there's a distinction between. So this takes like basically two to the, if you really want to be mathematical, this, there are two to the n elements here, right? And this is a function from a space which is two to the two to the n, which is all the subsets of two to the n. It's a much bigger function. This maps these guys to R. The other one maps two to the n to R. So this is little p theta of x. This is capital P theta of x. Not x, like a. Um, but if it bothers you, this is a pretty big space, two to the two to the n. So that's that's what a measure is. Okay, formal. So these are this is the, all the subsets of the in the cube. There are two to the n elements. And the subsets are two to the number of elements, which is two to the yeah. yeah. Is, the, uh, is the assumption that this is following like a Bernoulli trial, is that part of it too? Or we simply have to understand that for sure that it's part of the family of Bernoulli trials? Um, that's not part of the decision, but that's part of the specification of the problem, okay. right? That's, that, that's, a, that's basically the probability model. That's what we model. And you can question this model, whether it's actually a good model or not, but that's what we specify, okay. right? Before specifying it, there's no decision theory. So once I specify, this is now a well-defined model. I have my, this is my family of probability distribution parameters by theta. Uh, my action space, I'm gonna take it to be uh, the same as the parameter space. And I'm gonna take the log to be the quadratic log space. Now I have everything is specified. Now I can talk about decision rules. What is a good decision or what is a bad decision? You can certainly question this, and a lot of statistics basically falls apart because this is not true. Okay, that's but we're not going to worry too much about that in this course. Later, you're going to have to worry about that. But for a Bernoulli problem, um, the most general thing is a general measure in this. Like if you want to be very general, the most general model that you can see is all the possible probability distributions of this, basically, all the possible functions of this one. Um, but that's a very huge space. We can basically do anything. Okay, so that would include the measures that that have a lot of dependence. So, for example, it could be that x one and x two and x three are the same, and then things become random. Okay, that's a particular measure. Uh, it could be like this influences the other one in a probabilistic fashion, like the Markov chain. So, if if the first one is one, there's more chance that the second one is one as well, and so on. So, there could be all sorts of dependencies. Those are also probability measures, uh, but but they fall uh, 
outside the family that you're specifying. You can make your family as big as possible. Actually, I have a problem. I think I can assign it again. Um, if the family is too big, there's no hope you can do any estimation. Okay, there is this tension between how big of a family you can assume and how well you can estimate. Uh, if you just assume that my family of among all possible distributions on this new cube, that's hopeless. And basically, you can show that you're going to make like errors. Uh, I'm going to assign the problem. Think about it, it, it's easy to think about it. once you get past the conceptual, conceptualizing what the measure is. Um, but that's a very good point. Okay. This is part of our assumption at this point. Any other questions? This may or may not be a good assumption. Assuming that you're doing the point that it's a reasonable assumption. Okay. So far, according to physics, okay. maybe later people like find dependencies across. Um, okay, once you specify, no, no other question. So in your two to the n, which two is the base two and base two? Uh, what is that? Uh, okay, so you want to see what the two to so two to the n is the number of so how many binary sequences of length n there are? There are two to the n, right? How many? So if I give you a subset of size, um, so I give you a subset of size, let's say a, b, c. Um, the size is let's say three. How many subsets does this set have? Sorry, okay. what is eight? So eight is like two to the n, like two to the three, which is eight. So if I give you a subset, the number of subsets of that subset is two to the number. So if this is like uh, x, basically, if I want to do this correctly, this is my x, let's say. Um, the cardinality of x is three. The number of subsets of x sometimes actually is written like this. This is a, like a formal notation. The, the number is like two to the capital X, which is two to the three, which is eight. So now X is like zero one one um, to the N. So the cardinality of X itself is two to the N. We can verify. Like there are two choices for each coordinate and they're independent. So they're two to the N. And then so this power, this is sometimes called power set. This is the, the set of all, this is a notation for the set of all subsets of X. So the cardinality of this would be two to the cardinality of x, which is two to the two to the n. That's how it happens. So the number of measures uh, on this space is equivalent to the number of functions from the space that that this many points to the like zero to one. It's just a minor point if you want to think about the complexity. This is good to think about. It's just a big space. Uh, okay. Other questions? Did that answer your question? Okay. No other questions? Okay, so let's do actually some statistics. So once I specified this, um, I'm gonna like propose some estimator. So what is actually a good estimator? So if you wanna estimate the, the probability of coming up heads, what would you do? Right? Sample mean. Sample mean, okay, good. So um, because, um, yeah, because the, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the probability of one, just average the number like the number of observations, or like how many ones you have divided by the total number, which is going to be the sample. Right. So um, that's a very uh, natural estimator here. So at like sum x y from one to n and divide by n. That's the sample mean. Um, we're, we're going to calculate, and, and you can calculate the risk. So the risk is specified by the loss, okay, so this is called a uh, quadratic loss or um, squared error loss. And once I specify this, you can calculate under this model, the risk of um, delta one is gonna be this. We're gonna calculate this, okay, theta times one minus theta over here. Um, there's another estimator, which is um, the constant estimator. So this one ignores the observation. So just assumes that the coin is fair, it's always outputs one half. Okay, this is also an estimator. It may or may not be a good estimator, but it's a candidate. And for this one, you can actually calculate easily the risk where you take a minus one half squared. So why is that?
So R theta delta two is the expectation. The loss here is like theta minus delta two X squared, right? And then I plug in uh, delta two X one half. I can put a theta here as well. So what happens here? Which is a constant. Is a constant comes out, you get theta minus one half. So this is fairly easy to calculate. So there is still this. Uh, there's this standard estimator to add up bit here and then a bit here. And um, this is in Kina's book. And then you can calculate the risk for this is about to be that. Um, and then another one is where I throw all the data out except the first one. Um, it's a fourth candidate. I just decide based on the value of the first flip. If it's one, I'm going to say that this is how it goes. And it always come up one. Like it, it's the probability is one. And then it's zero, I'm gonna say it's always zero. Obviously not necessarily a good estimator, but that's also possible. You can just base your estimator based on some part of the tape. Uh, and then for this turns out to be the risk, turns out to be this. Okay, so um, we have the risk and the risk, and then we can compare them. So we want the one that minimizes the risk. Um, at this point, depending on the time, we can either try to see why this is true. I can tell you the punchline and then figure out why this is true late. So let me maybe try for a few minutes, see if we can, how do we calculate this? That's where this business um, of not needing the integration comes in. So you can calculate the risk of this estimator, the sample mean, without doing any integration. So how do we calculate that? So let me try. All right, there. Um, you guys can think about how to do it. Um, so I want to calculate the risk of um, theta delta one, which is going to be expectation theta minus delta one x squared which is uh, theta minus, I'm gonna write it as x bar n squared. So x bar n is basically one over n summation i from one to n sample mean. So this is not so easy because this is random. So how do we do this? So each x i is, is a Bernoulli random variable called t theta. Okay. Any guess or like? Uh, sorry, sorry. Can can you say it like from the start? Um, what should I write? Theta minus. Okay. And then in, you want to expand this? Okay, I'm going to expand it here. X i i from one to n. Uh, okay, so you want to do I see. Okay, so let's do something like theta minus. Thing. Is that what you want to do? Okay. Okay, how do we use independence? Thanks for doing this. This so could have gone wrong. What should I do with this model? Oh, you just Okay, so this comes out like one over in a square. And then I get summation i from one to n. Um, right? So why this is a variance? Where where does the, the, the variance come in? So now that's like the sum of like the variance of i, and most variables have been zeros. So like all the mixed terms, like the when that i times beta is a product, it's just zero. Okay, so I have to like maybe 
point out that this is zero me, right? That's what you're saying, okay? Right, why, why is that zero me? Xi, so the mean of Xi is theta, right? So there are a bunch of like uh, implicit arguments that you're making, uh, it's not everyone is, is like, let's, let's do it, but like, this is mean theta, like the mean of Xi is theta. Everyone knows, like sees that. What is the mean of Xi theta? All right, okay, so it seems like people know. Okay, so expectation of Xi minus theta is zero. Why is that? constant. Okay, you can move the constant inside expectation. This is sort of a linear expectation. I can also say this is also this like, theta minus Xi is zero as well. Then you're saying that the summation also has zero mean, right? Why is that? The expectation of linear, so I can move the sum out. So this is basically, but I'm happy that you did this this way because it's going to be fast. So this is zero, right? Right. So this is zero mean variable. Now the next claim is that because this is zero mean, so this, let's call this like y, right? So I have a random variable whose mean is zero. We have decided that this is zero, so this is y. Um, the claim is that expectation of y squared is the same as the variance. Why is that? Okay, good. So variance of this, um, basically variance uh, of y is expectation of y squared minus expectation of y squared. So this is zero. So the second moment is the same as the variance. So that's, I guess, um, so, so what's your name? What was your name? Wayman. Wayman. Okay, so that's what the argument that Wayman is making, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, so that would be the variance of y, right? Or like one over n squared variance of uh, summation i from one to n, whatever this is. So what is the next step then? Great, right. so variance of the sum of a bunch of independent variables is some of the variances. This is not true if they're not independent or like basically correlated. Um, so I get variance of this. Um, so what is the variance of theta minus xi? This is xi. What is the variance of xi? Oh, sorry, what is the variance of this? Why is that? Okay, we can say that this is also the variance of xi first. Why is this? Shifts. Shifts. Yeah, variance doesn't care about shifts or if you multiply, like, I can drop this and then the sign doesn't matter. So this is the same as this. And this is the variance of Bernoulli is theta one minus theta. You can verify this, it's easy. You can use this formula, for example. Okay, this is theta, this is uh, theta squared, basically. So you get theta one minus theta. Okay, uh, this was a very clever way of doing it. So now what? what happens? So these are constant, basically because these are IID, all the variances are the same. I'm summing over one from one to n, so I get n copies of this. So I get one over n squared, and then n times theta one minus theta, so the ends cancel out, right? And it proves okay. okay. There are other ways, a lot of other ways to do it. One way to do it, which I don't recommend is to try to expand this. Like square, square Earth box is, is um, preferred because you can expand things. Once you expand it, you take the square, square times theta times that, and then you go down that path. It takes a while, but you end up with the same solution. Everyone is happy with this. So you can see there is a bunch of properties of expectation, linearity of expectations. You can say that this is the only, and then this property, the variance, the variance of the sum of uh, all the variances, which is like the key, basically, thing that, that makes things work. Um, another way you're saying it, like variance of, the sample mean is basically, um, this is another way of saying it, like later you'd realize this is the variance of the sample mean. And 
the variance of the sampling is one over n times the variance of a single one, because this is the mean of the sample. Okay, so this is this random variable minus this mean squared. So this would be, this is like, uh, let's say first place, this is the second place argument, and then the third place argument. So this would be the variance of x bar. And the variance of sample mean from basic statistics, you know, it's one over n. Right. Okay, we're happy with this. So you can go through this argument if it was if like um, any, any questions, we can come back later next week uh, or next next uh, lecture. So let me give you the punch knife. So the other one you can also calculate similarly. So once you specify the model, you can see you can calculate these things. And once you specify the decision rules, now I want to compare them. And um, the minute I try to compare them, I run into an issue. What is the issue if you think about it? Like what is it? We don't know theta, so these are functions. So what I can do is try to plot it as a function of theta for all values of theta. Okay, so this is the plot uh, for n equal 10 and equal 50. Uh, n equal 10 and equal. Okay, so this this line is a sample mean. That's a one, and you can see if theta equal to zero, theta equal to one, it goes to zero. It's equal to zero. That's like theta um, one minus theta over n. And uh, the other one, which is this same one, which is this one, that's the delta three. Uh, this this one, um, if you imagine, um, the, the the risk of this you can also compute or just set n equal to one here. So, we can use it this. so that's the fourth estimator. That's the um, this um, blank one. Okay, so this is delta one, the sample mean. This is the one that ignores everything except the first uh, uh, sample. This is the strange looking one. And this uh, green one is uh, the cost and estimated. That, that says just predict uh, one half for all x. Okay, so how, how do we compare them there? Is there any winner here? Can you say anyone is better than the other one or the other ones? Okay, so you can say that delta one is better than delta four for sure because sort of this one dominates this everywhere. So everywhere you look, the risk of delta one is better than the risk of delta two. Sorry, delta four. So that's that's in terminology we'll see later. We say that delta one like, dominates the other one, so makes the other one inadmissible. That's the terminology. So I can throw out um, delta four. Delta four is not a good estimator because I can achieve. Anything that can be, it can achieve and better by delta one. Okay, so this rule, delta one basically rules this other guy inadmissible in the language. Let's see. So if I throw that out, is there any other clear choice here? Yeah. Uh, okay, so you're not trying to like solve the problem. Yes. Yeah, so the basic idea is that at this point, we can't do anything more. Okay. So there's no clear cut like solution here. So even I can't I can't rule out the constant estimate. So the one that predicts one half or like all values of x, it's gonna be really good near one half. It's gonna be like beating these other guys near one half. If the, the coin is actually fair, this is gonna do very well. Okay, um, which is which might seem strange, but we can't um, from a decision theory perspective at this point rule this out. Um, so we have to resort to some other techniques. One is trying to reduce this whole curve into a number by taking the area, let's say. Or if you want to say in the language of statistics, we, you're going to take a weighted average. You're going to do Bayesian approach. The Bayesian approach reduces this risk into, I'm going to take, put weights on, on different parts of the space. So I might have a prior information that I'm near here. I don't care about these parts. So I'm going to make these more, make these less, and then take an average, weighted average with the weights that I put on the theta axis. That's basically what Bayesians, not what Bayesians think they're doing, but like a decision theory perspective of what Bayesians do is that they put a prior on, on this line, basically a mass on this line average. So if they care about this part, they're gonna like throw out the rest. And, uh, so that's one way. Um, the other way is, I'm gonna wrap up. The other way is uh, taking the maximum, the worst case. Okay, 
So if you look at the worst case, uh, the worst case risk of this, for example, is bigger than the worst case risk of, not at this point, but maybe here. And then for 50, the worst case risk of this is here, the worst case risk of this is here. So from a worst case perspective, if you want to cover the whole thing, um, this uh, blue one is beating the sample mean. So if you care about the sort of minimax risk, which is, which is what the maximum risk is doing, that, that's, that's another way of reducing the ACD to an average. So you can take a weighted average or you can take a maximum. There are other ways you can make a tricky class of estimators um, and, and, and some other approaches. So that's basically what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to come back and um, sort of try to work our ways towards these solutions. Okay. Thank you guys for the work on the next slide. Thank <laughs> you.